Hello and welcome everyone and we can see you logging in. Thank you for writing your name or where you're coming for you're calling from. This is uh, always exciting to see so many people from the US and and abroad. Uh, we are very back and uh, excited to talk about this uh, topic which is diabetes today. And just as a reminder everybody should have gotten the chapter from Dr. McDougall's book where um, you can read about diabetes and um, I think that today his wife Mary is joining us. Dr. McDougall is in Santa Rosa, California. I'm Gustavo Tolosa here in Dallas, Texas. Dr. McDougall is an MD, an internist doctor who is still treating patients. He's been practicing medicine for over 40 years and he has tremendous amounts of information to uh, share with us today and uh, uh, we're well ready to hear you, Dr. McDougall. How are you doing today? I, I'm ready to go. I've had. Uh, You're ready to go. Yes. Oh, you know, I tell you, I have been so busy, and you know, uh, we just ran a program with 115 people in it uh, from a company, and you and I are going to be working together on more <laughs> company programs. It's a, uh, it's been busy. Uh, I, I didn't, by the way, I did not get my Babe Ruth bar on Halloween. You did not. <laughs> no, I haven't seen the grandkids yet. I. <clears throat> Remember, I eat one Babe Ruth bar. The kids go out and collect it. Grandkids. Well, that's a whole other story. But yeah, the book you were supposed to read was this one right here. We, uh, that's we right. Read the chapters. We're going to talk about different things like uh, arthritis and diabetes in here and so on. And that was me when I wrote the book. All right. And you were also supposed to read this uh, newsletter, which is what I send you whenever you say, how do I treat my type 2 diabetes? It's uh, uh, a newsletter, it's free on the website, no gimmicks. It's the December 2009 newsletter, and we'll talk about that. <clears throat> but first, uh, I want to get into uh, something else, and that is the newsletter I wrote last month. If you, if you didn't read it. Yeah, it's uh, right you, here. Yeah, yeah. Very good newsletter. Very good. Uh, it, I, put, uh, I, I put a lot of work into it. I always do on my newsletters. And, you know, some people wonder why I do this and if I'm afraid when I write things like that. Like somebody, I, I guess I can get away with this. Somebody <laughs> said, but Roby said that I had balls the size of Jupiter. And I wrote back and I said, no, they're the size of Mercury. And, uh, <laughs> and I had a few other cups. But I, no, I just don't know. I mean, I just don't have that kind of interaction with people. I, I seem to get along with everybody. Uh, the dairy industry is not going to write me about this article. I enjoy writing it. I, I like to tell you what I know and what I believe, and I still remember a lot of things. Anyway, this uh, newsletter article that came out two days ago is called, uh, maybe two days ago. It's the October newsletter. It's called Chocolate Milk Disease in Disguise because what the dairy industry calls it is they call it chocolate milk nutrition in disguise, which is, uh, you know, one of their big fat lies. Uh, you think you can watch their ad just by clicking there, you're going to tell. Uh, they got a dietitian telling children it's good for them to drink milk and this smart and good nutrition and it's just all terrible. Uh, I told a story about how when I was a little kid, like five, six, seven years old, we had a morning break and they made us drink a carton of something, either unsalted tomato juice, which was really it was unpalatable, it was so disgusting. Mm -hmm. Or I could have white milk for two cents or chocolate milk for three cents and I came from a very low income family. And so that one penny made a big difference to me, but I still had to buy the chocolate because I couldn't get the white down. And I tell about how my uh, grandson, who's almost 13, when he was in uh, kindergarten in Calistoga, California, to get out of the, the milk was free at break, but to get out of the milk program, his parents had to pay, pay $2 a day for juice. And that still goes on in your school. That's how the dairy industry owned the schools, is they give you milk for free and they have all kinds of plans that are, integrated between the United States Department of Agriculture and your school system. Kids just don't stand a chance. Uh, I have a copy in that newsletter of what, what the nutritional label is for chocolate milk. It's, uh, it's equivalent to Coca-Cola, uh, regular Coca-Cola, not diet Coca-Cola. It's equivalent to Coca-Cola and worse. And uh, same amount of sugar is just in cow's milk. Half, half the sugar comes from the cow. And to make chocolate milk, they had another equal amount of sugar so that you can get it down. Uh, I talk in here in the newsletter about how this is the basic problem is we're drinking cow's milk and we're human beings, just like you wouldn't drink rat milk or whale milk or, or kangaroo milk. You know, those, that's the wrong species. Those, those milks are species specific. 
for that particular offspring. And when you feed cow's milk to infants, you cause overnutrition. If you fed uh, infant mother's milk to a cow, they become under deficient. You'd be arrested for farm animal abuse and put in jail. But you can feed a uh, human baby cow's milk and, and people think it's good nutrition. Anyway, I talked to you about that. I talked to you about uh, how experts agree you can go look at it. There's no such thing as calcium deficiency that ever occurs in anybody on any natural diet. It's just all unique positioning to sell dairy. And then I told you in here about how cow, cow's milk is dirty. Um, it's the filth. It's just filthy with chemicals, all kinds of environmental chemicals. And um, then I told you about how it was also uh, filthy with bovine leukemia viruses and all kinds of things. You can look this up. I mean, at the dairy industry, uh, it's not like they they can keep it from getting out. It's just nobody cares. They have so much money that they can bury anything they want. Uh, you say all the milk is infected with leukemia viruses and chimpanzees fed infected leukemia milk, laden milk, get it, leukemia. Uh, they don't care as long as you don't look for it and nobody tells them about it. They just keep on selling milk. <clears throat> so it's a dirty industry of real people doing just bit regular jobs. It's not a conspiracy, but they're killing your kids. Mary, oh, hey, Mary's here. Come on in, Mary, because you've got a section of the newsletter, too. Do you want to use half of my uh, headset, or are you just going to bring it? I'm just going to sit right here. All right. Uh, Good. So so we're right welcoming here. Mary, then. There she is. Hi. My favorite, my favorite friend. Oh, there you go. Here, so. Hi, Mary. Everybody's okay, you, you excited to see you. They're over there. No, I didn't print out the recipe. Oh, you didn't. Oh, Tom, what you put nice. in? Well, I put in a recipe um, from a restaurant that's yes. in Napa Valley, but it's also all around the world. And you can find the recipe online, um, but it's different than the recipe that I put in. Mine is a little bit more pure. Yeah, it's really, really good. <laughs> and what do you call the recipe? The boyfriend burger. And you'll know why you call it what. Well, it's a good thing yeah. to try, and then you put a hot and sour I soup. I put in a hot and sour soup because I got a request from someone who loved my hot and sour soup recipe, and it was from a newsletter that we published in 1998, yeah. I think, and those aren't online. And he couldn't find it anywhere, and so I had John. I found it. Help, <laughs> help, believe, help me believe find me, it. I was history. rewarded adequately, so history. don't you worry, but I did find it. And uh, so that, that recipe is in there also. Um, for someone who asked for it. So if, if you ever can't find a recipe um, because it's in an old newsletter or something else, just write and I'll have John try and find it for you. Really, and I will <laughs> I, I will be very favored afterwards. So don't you That's, hesitate. Uh, you'll be glad to find <laughs> it. Don't you hesitate to have Mary ask me something. And you also, the holidays are coming up? Uh, the holidays are coming up. And so I also included my special holiday recipe section because like john said we just ran a really large program and one of the questions that one of the participants had was what am i going to serve for thanksgiving and christmas when all my friends come over and i said well i just happen to have um a whole list of recipes that i always serve um to my family and i did change one recipe though i changed it to my favorite um really creamy um gravy recipe but that i make with rice milk we're having that tonight, we're for having that tonight for oh, dinner. folks i tell you this is a killer she's going to make mashed potatoes tonight in your instant pot in my instant without pot. peeling them uh, without peeling them i just put them in there with with two cups of water and turn them on for 20 minutes and they're done and then i just pour okay, out then. i pour out a little bit of the water and i take my little handy masher and i mash them and then i make the gravy Oh, and some corn. Oh, and yeah. some corn yeah. No, I have broccolini tonight. So we're having broccolini tonight. But I, I'll tell you, I could eat that. You know, I'll tell you about my favorite bean and potato dishes. But I, I with that gravy, I could put that gravy on cardboard. Yeah. Eat it. It's really, <laughs> really amazing. So anyway, that recipe I switched out for one of the other recipes that was a little bit more um, time consuming because you had to sit there and stir it all the time. And this one is made with rice flour and it doesn't clump like wheat flour does. And then all the sh shopping lists are there and all the ingredients that you need. So 
for people that have been using this for a long time, yes, it's a repeat, but for there are a lot of new people out there. And it's updated. Mm -hmm. but, and it's in the newsletter this month, the October 2016 newsletter, getting you ready for our November holiday of Thanksgiving. And then you know, for those who celebrate Christmas or any other holiday, you know, this is uh, uh, shows you how to put the whole holiday meal together, sin turkey. <laughs> you know, anyway, uh, you'll find that very helpful. The stuffed pumpkin yes. is my centerpiece. Yeah. Dr. Michael, right. can you ask and Mary a question? The thing I question? want to talk to people about is the Kauai trip. No, she, we have a question first. Oh, we have a question? Okay. What's the question? Yes, uh, someone is asking why can't the old newsletters be scanned online? Oh, you know, I can do a lot of things. <laughs> you know, okay. But, I'm, but right now I'm only working 14 hours a day. <laughs> but they can be, should be, and it's not a problem. And actually I know a company <clears throat> that can do that because it's the same company that scanned the uh, Pritikin Review of the Scientific Literature, which is a 500-page document, which mm -hmm. is also linked mm -hmm. in that uh, newsletter. <clears throat> and if you are a clinician, if you are a dietitian, if you are a curious person, and you want to see what the truth is, uh, and that is the research published before industry bought the journals and the researchers. Uh, Nathan Pritikin did this whole 500-page review. Uh, it's not for the lighthearted. Believe me, there's a <laughs> lot of facts in there. But anybody who's serious about knowing the truth, not the crap from the dairy industry, not the meat industry's lies, not the fish industries that, you know, if you want to know what the truth is, then you read Nathan Pritikin's document, which I, at great effort and some expense, put up there for you for free. So, yes, I could do all the newsletters. I could do them all. I may just do that. I have a, uh, I have a company that will do it, and then we can scan them and put them up. And if you want them, we probably all right, can. what's happening with Kauai? Oh, Kauai. I have eight oceanfront rooms left for for our last Kauai trip, and that's it. You can't get any more. I can't get any more. You can't get any garden rooms. I can't get any more garden rooms. I I have eight oceanfront rooms left, and that's all. So if you're interested at all in getting away from the snow at the end of January. You know, all that money you got stuck under the mattress or the money you were saving for when you get old, uh, spend it now. It, uh, it, there's no sense in, in, in saving it. That's my philosophy because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know whether we're going to run another quiet trip. I doubt it. You doubt it. You don't know whether we're going to run any more adventure trips. I don't trips, know whether I'm going to run any more yeah. adventure trips you know, at we're, all. We're 70 years old, so we have had uh, thoughts about changing the business. But for sure, we're going to Kauai at the best at the best food we've ever had in oh, 30 adventure trips yeah. ever. It's, it's just, that's why we're going back to the Sheraton Kauai. And there's a beach right next to We don't door. usually go back the to place. the same place. We did, we did in, in Costa, Costa Rica. Rica. Yeah. But um, there, because there wasn't anything else. Well, they deserve our business. They I mean, do. Last, last they time I think we had business. 80 people. We got a lot more than that now. But uh, <clears throat> we had kids going along. Uh, Heather's children are going along. Possibly my brother's children are going. There are other children going along. But it's not a children-dominated trip. There are lots and lots and lots of single people. Lots of single people yeah. this time. And families and people who have traveled with us for 30 years. So yeah. it, it's a, a friendly trip. I give one lecture. Otherwise, Mary and I just can't kind of hang around and read and talk and play with you and the kids. So it, it leaves January, uh, January. January 28th to February 4th. And she's got eight rooms. I have eight rooms And left. she cannot get any, <laughs> any, any, any more rooms. It's not like she's been borrowing with me for the last for the last six months. Well, maybe I could get a few, because you've sold out like three times. Maybe I could get a few more rooms. Yeah, Mary, but Mary, this time they told me... Uh, I'm done. She's done. I'm done. So anyway, if you would like to come with so us on the trip. So if you would like to join us, and we would love to be, be with you, uh, don't hesitate because when those eight rooms are gone, that's it. And I'll give you a little hint. Don't say, well, we'll join them next year. That's not a good way to think. Okay. <laughs> this is a good trip to go on. Mary and I are looking forward to at our best to we'll meet a lot of our family. And the beach right next door is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Oh, so... This will be, this will be. You can walk for miles down the front of the beach there. Okay. Well, anyway, this is, this is one of your <laughs> last enough. invitations. I'll tell you, you'll probably be sold out by the end of next week. I hope so. Well, then how about Very all good. these people who want to come well, that, that haven't taken the trouble to sign <laughs> they up? Haven't, you, they, could, you could be sold out by the end of the day. I could be. I, we did that for Alaska once. 
We still have about 24 hours. Well, we did. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, it's, it's a, a well worth our trip, and we'd love to have you come. But you go to the website, go to the 800 number, and don't sit there and say, well, I'll go next time, or it's too expensive. Or, what are you going to do with money? <laughs> no. We pretty much spend everything we make, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there are a lot of people who aren't like that. They're yeah, like us. No, I guess. Well, maybe they'll take care of us when we're old and retired because <laughs> we don't have any money left. <laughs> All right. All right. Let me go well, on and talk about that. Back to your. Um, Thank you, Mary. Go, what, you, what you were going to talk about? Yeah, go work on your Kauai. Okay. Day. All right. <laughs> bye, bye, everybody. Okay. Bye, bye, Mary. Okay. So, Gustavo, you want me to go into diabetes a little bit, or you want to? Sure, sure. Yourself? Please, if you just mention a few. Uh, All right. Facts. Good. I, I would like to do that. I, I kind of forgot. I read all this stuff, the book and the article. I read it all and studied it carefully for you last week, and. Oh, unfortunately, we had technical problems. It was beyond uh, Gustavo's and my control. But thank goodness Gustavo put the effort into it to get us back alive and well this week. And next week, I guess Doug Lyle's going to be on, and I'll be on and after that. But what we're going to do is talk about diabetes. So let's talk about it a little bit. <clears throat> uh, diabetes is uh, just uh, the, the definition is just basically elevated blood sugar, which can come from a couple of different means. But the means that we're talking about has to do with the insulin produced in the pancreas. There are uh, two ends of the spectrum. There's type one diabetes where the entire pancreas has been destroyed. The beta, beta cells that produce insulin have been destroyed. How are they destroyed? They're destroyed through an autoimmune reaction where the body makes antibodies to foreign proteins. In this case, the research says that when you consume a cow in the form of cow's milk primarily, the beta casein goes into the bloodstream the body recognizes this, the immune system recognizes the beta casein of the cow's milk as something foreign. Cows running around in my blood. So it makes antibodies to this uh, foreign protein, beta casein. Actually, we know the 17 uh, amino acids that these antibodies are made to, which are on the beta casein protein, which are also the same 17 amino acids in the same structural form and sequence are on the insulin producing cells of the pancreas. So this foreign cow, because you feed yourself, by the way, it's not just children, half people over age who get type one diabetes are adults. So if you feed yourself cow's milk, it goes through your gut into your bloodstream, the body as it should makes antibodies to the cow's milk. But in the process of looking for that beta casein, it finds the beta cells in the pancreas and destroys them. It takes on average three to five years to destroy an entire pancreas. And then you have type one diabetes and then you're insulin dependent the rest of your life. If you wanna ruin a family, you wanna ruin a family, you give them a case of type one diabetes and the whole family structure has changed. And by the way, this was public, published by the American Academy of Pediatrics in 1994. This uh, causal relationship still exists, hasn't changed. It's just, as I say, the dairy industry has all the money. They can twist and lie, but you can go to the internet, to Google or to the uh, National Library of Medicine. You can put in uh, type one diabetes and uh, dairy or cow's milk and just have a, a ball. You'll find, you'll find probably 200 articles to tell you what I tell you. All right, so that, that's how the pancreas is usually destroyed. I was taught it was destroyed by the same kind of reaction. It's called molecular mimicry with a virus, like a measles virus. But the virus, folks, is cow milk protein in most cases. All right, so that's type one. You destroyed the whole pancreas. Now, uh, the other extreme is type two. Now, type two, the pancreas works just great. It's making loads of insulin. In fact, often twice as much as somebody without diabetes. It's working overtime. The reason it's working overtime is because it's trying to overcome insulin resistance. Insulin resistance, always develops because you're too fat. You got too much fat in your body fat tissues, you got too much fat in your liver, you got too much fat every place. And the body says, hey, you're getting too fat. You know what's gonna happen to you? You're gonna get so fat that when the saber tooth tiger comes chasing you, he's gonna eat you because you can't run away or you can't get into the cave, into the hole because you're just too fat. So it's not a survival advantage to be too fat. Oh no, you can gain 30, 40, 50 pounds in preparation for winter, but you can't gain 60 pounds because that's too fat. So the body develops insulin resistance. So the insulin doesn't work well at the cellular level. As a result, 
fat is forced into fat cells by insulin. That's its job. So when you make insulin resistance, then less fat can go into the fat cells. Okay, that's good. Now you stop gaining weight, but you make less insulin and your regular cells are resistant too, and so your blood sugar goes up. And that's the sign you focus on, is this elevated blood sugar. That's not the problem. Not the, problem. the problem is, is your developed body has normally, naturally, as it should, developed resistance to insulin, so you don't become 500 pounds overweight. And by the way, I have seen people 500 pounds overweight. I've seen news, newscasts where they had to come in with a, uh, with a, uh, uh, with a hand truck, you know, not a hand truck, you know, one of those lifters, and had to pick somebody out of their bed with a forklift and take them to the hospital because they were 1,400 pounds. Well, that's in, the, in that case, you don't develop insulin resistance, so your body just keeps stuffing fat into fat cells. And you also don't have diabetes. You just weigh a half a ton. All right, so but let's forget about that rare individual. I've seen him five or six, ten times, that one that weighs over 500 pounds overweight. Let's talk about the typical type 2 diabetes. It is caused by being too fat. So how can you fix it? Well, any way that loses weight. And the current way to treat type 2 diabetes by popularity is to rearrange your stomach through bariatric surgery. There's an 80% cure rate by bariatric surgery, and it's reported in the journals. Everybody goes, and they really are. The doctors out there going, oh, now he doesn't know how to solve the problem. We're just taking, uh, do a band, a stomach band, or a, a sleeve, or some intestinal bypass. We'll cure type 2 diabetes. And then, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not joking. That's a new multi-billion dollar year business to treat a disease caused by overnutrition. Well, let me give you some other thoughts on how you can do this. The key is weight loss. So any way that causes weight loss will cure type 2 diabetes. Dentists used to cure type 2 diabetes by wiring your teeth together. Yes, they did. Uh, oncologists can cure type 2 diabetes by giving you cancer chemotherapy so you lose your appetite and you lose weight, and they cure, they cure type 2 diabetes with chemotherapy. Brain surgeons, they could do it with uh, prefrontal lobotomies. They just put a... a a probe in here and kind of scrape off some of your brain tissue so you lose your appetite. And they have just cured type 2 diabetes. Right. Amazing profession I have. And one last way you can do it, my general surgeon buddies, you know, general surgeons, if they do bilateral lower extremity amputations, then you can't get to the refrigerator. And we've just cured type 2 diabetes. All right, let's get off that joke. So you got type 1, uh, total absence of uh, production of insulin. You've got type 2 overproduction of insulin. There's something in between. It's called type 1 and a half. And I see lots of these people who say they're type 2, but they're thin and their blood sugars are still up. So they're not type 2. They have partial pancreatic insufficiency. They're type 1 and a half. They make enough insulin to stay out of the hospital, but not to make enough insulin to keep the blood sugars normal. And you notice that when people are relatively thin and still have elevated blood sugars. So do understand that difference. It's extremely important. There's total insulin insufficiency, complete sufficiency, and there's something in between that a lot of people have. Some of the pancreas has been destroyed. They have type 1 and a half. So let me tell you how I treat type 1 and a half, because type 2, type 2 is entirely curable by weight loss. And type 1 always requires insulin. I usually give them a long-acting insulin. I, don't, I stay way away from these insulin pumps and all this technology. It ruins people's lives, but we don't have to go into that. Uh, I use a little insulin. A, a body requires about 40 insulins a day. 40, excuse me, 40 units of insulin a day is what a human body requires. So somewhere or another, you get them around 40 units. Uh, but I know some people are chasing blood sugars so that they're taking 80 or 120, and they've got all these pumps, and you're, you're ruining your life. You're ruining your whole life. So <clears throat> now we've got type 1 needs insulin. Type 2 never needs insulin. Always cure type 1 and a half. How do I treat type 1 and a half diabetics? Well, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't put them on any pills because the pills are so deathly toxic. I will not prescribe any diabetic pills, including metformin. And we'll talk about that later. Maybe, let's say, I think it's September of 2017. I have an expert on metformin coming. I don't use it. My uh, son does, maybe less, more, less often as he used to. Dr. Lim does or did until he started rethinking metformin. He knew all the other ones. Uh, were were deadly dangerous. They'd kill you from heart disease. Everybody knows that. You know, all, all the other drugs on the market are uh, do far more harm than good, but they still argue about metformin. And I'll tell you, metformin does far more does more harm than good. It's the least toxic of the very toxic drugs. So I never prescribe pills. 
what I do in a, a type one and a half diabetic is I do treat them for three three issues. One is if they lose too much weight. You know, if, if I was a type one and a half diabetic, I'm 150 pounds now. If I weighed 110 pounds, you know, that would not be good. And the way to keep the weight on is I'd have to add some insulin. So I add a little long acting insulin called Lantus. So for too much weight loss, I add some uh, insulin, usually one dose in the evening, enough to stop the weight loss. If a diabetic develops symptoms of diabetes, such as excess urination, which is troublesome, all a little Lantus will take care of that too. And the third reason is, and I have to tell you, Gustavo and everybody listening, is I'm a real doctor. I take care of all kinds of problems, including mental problems, emotional problems. See, when your mother-in-law gets worried, or your husband gets worried, or your doctor gets worried, they're worried about the numbers, or you get worried, hey, I can make the numbers look better by giving you a little insulin. I seriously do, because people are, are, are so traumatized by high numbers, and they're so worried because they're not taking the medicine because they've been so educated by the drug companies and their doctors, which only have one trick in their doctor bag, and that's to give them drugs, that they're scared. And so what I'll do sometimes is I'll give somebody a little Lantus. Now, how much Lantus do I use to stop the weight loss, to stop the excessive urination, to stop people from worrying? Well, it could be 10 units, could be 20. Certainly no more than 40, because as I told you, the body only makes 40 units of insulin, and that should be enough. Anyway, I provided you in a lot of a lot of things that are true and basic in the book, uh, McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion. This article from 2009, September, is the exact way I treat type 2 diabetes. It tells you how aggressive treatment kills, and it does. The studies show, uh, the uh, or the CORD, the advance, and the veteran studies show that people who are aggressively treated to make their hemoglobin A1C look normal, say 6%, have a, a, a greatly increased risk of dying, dying of heart disease, suffering hypoglycemia, gaining weight. It's all there. Everybody knows it. Everybody, know, everybody knows this. There's not a doctor or a scientist out there that doesn't know this, yet you will be treated aggressively. You'll be treated to make your hemoglobin A1C close to 6%. Now, there are exceptions now. There are doctors who are waking up. And realize that this is very dangerous. So when I generalize, I still say the vast majority of doctors are doing the wrong thing, but some are waking up. And uh, then they're saying, where should we make the hemoglobin A1C? What level should we choose? Well, uh, a Kaiser, I believe, chooses 7%. My question is, why? They have no reason. Well, why don't you choose 8%? Well, maybe that'd be okay. But why? They have no reason to do that. They have no reason to choose a particular hemoglobin A1C level as a goal. They do not. So it could be 10% that's best. All I can tell you is when you're treating yourself with insulin, because I don't use pills, don't get hypoglycemia. Uh, aim for a blood sugar of about 150 milligram percent, 150 milligram percent, which is uh, in international units, you divide by 18. Uh, aim for that blood sugar in the morning. I encourage you not to check your sugar throughout the day. It'll drive you nuts. Even if you're type one, it'll drive you nuts. What are you gonna do if you, unless you're that kind of micromanagement person, you do yourself harm psychologically and physically. Uh, check it once a day, have it above 150 milligrams per deciliter. How high? Well, let's just pick a number. You ask me why, I don't know. Say as high as 350 milligrams per deciliter in the morning. Remember divide by 18 to get international units. I think that's good treatment as far as drug therapy, but the absolutely fundamental, most important treatment is you must eat well if you're type two or type one. The only people with type 2 diabetes I have seen live 40 years and more without any complications, no eye damage, no kidney damage, you know, perfectly good health, except for they require supplemental insulin, are people who have been raised on a diet similar to what I recommend, and I have seen that. Otherwise, your risk of blindness, kidney failure, other complications of diabetes is, uh, you know, close to 100% within 11 to 17 years of disease. So uh, you may never grow your pancreas back, so what? That's the way life is. They may never find you an artificial pancreas. So what? That's the way it is. But you cannot feed yourself a diet that kills people without diabetes. That's the American diet. People die of heart disease, of, of cancer, of et cetera. Uh, they don't have diabetes. They're normal functioning pancreas. You take somebody with diabetes with a non-functional pancreas and they are metabolically handicapped. So a type 1 diabetic gets an infection in their toe. They could lose their leg in a day or two because they can't defend and repair. They have this metabolic handicap. I get an infection in my toe. 
I could let it go for six months that my immune system, system would take care of it. So you are, you are just real sensitive people. That's just the way it is. So you cannot feed yourself things that kill people without diabetes, like meat and chicken and fish and cheese and you know, all the animal foods and all the toxic oils. You must eat a starch-based diet strictly. I've taken care of people for 40 years. Even I remember a beauty queen one time. Irrelevant. But maybe in this day and age, politics it's not. But I mean, I just, I just remember she was like 18 years old. And she would have been blind and dead and sick by now. That was 40 years ago. But she listened. She said, you know, I, I will eat well. And I give myself a little insulin. And uh, life has been good for her as far as I know. And the other diabetics would listen to this. So your doctor only has one bag in his bag of tricks. And that's a bunch of pills. Excuse me. He has only one trick in his bag of tricks. And that's a bunch of pills. But you best know that diet is fundamental. And judicious use of medication, as I described, is uh, important. And the diabetes discussion, what do you have to ask me? <laughs> <laughs> very good, Dr. Michael. That, that, that's just very, very good. I yeah. just, you know, I so, so many of the questions that I have here are from people that um, are, are, are measuring their blood sugar, like you were saying, like three, four, five times a day or more. Uh, there you go. <laughs> I just want you to know what you're saying. Is the starch solution came out in an audio ver version. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's what this oh, is. That it's is awesome. Yes, yeah, so you can buy and listen to the car. I, I don't know how you do these things, but I'm wow. sure you can find it on Amazon. It's oh, the, the audio. Sure. All those you want of that book, it's an audio now. And of course, the healthy side of the planet is doing wonderful. I'm ready for questions. Let's okay, so what do we do? You, what do you say? People that say, "Well, I, I eat a potato or some, or, or, or I eat lunch and I measure my blood sugar and it's, it's, it's skyrocketing." I mean, when when are people supposed to to measure their blood sugar right before they eat? I I, I assume not. I, I I don't know why they measure their blood sugar. I mean, you need to check it. I think once a day if you're type one diabetic. Right. And if you're type two, you never check it. And if you're type one and a half, you just kind of check it once in a while why they lived on rice was 90% of the diet. So I think that's clear enough. Your goal should not be an ideal blood sugar, even though that's what you're told, because mm -hmm. that's the only thing your doctor knows. And billions of dollars are made on drug pills, which are very dangerous. And insulin ain't cheap either. And it's going up in price, you know, mm -hmm. just like the, uh, the EpiPen. Hey, they found out that they can charge more for insulin too. So it's getting really expensive. And, uh, I'm gonna stop with that question. Yeah, okay. yeah, better. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, Doctor McTullough, this is an interesting question. Do autoimmune diseases and diabetes type two frequently occur together? Uh, no, <clears throat> I mean they can because people eat the same diet. But the uh, frequency of occurrences with autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto's thyroiditis or rheumatoid arthritis and type one diabetes. Okay, because they're all autoimmune diseases. There's also another common denominator which must be considered, which is celiac disease. People who have problems with wheat, barley, and, bri and rye, they knock down their brush border, it becomes incompetent, and so milk proteins, for example, more easily leak into the bloodstream on other animal proteins, and they go through molecular mimicry, and they're more likely to give you rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, et cetera, when you have celiac disease. But uh, type 2 diabetes is just due to being too fat. It's from overnutrition. And yes, the same kind of diet will give you autoimmune diseases, but there's no direct cor correlation as there is with type 1. So when people have multi auto multiple autoimmune diseases, like they say they have thyroiditis, got lost the thyroid, or they have some kind of arthritis, or they have uh, a colitis, or uh, type 1 diabetes, as we're talking about. Uh, every doctor and every patient should look to a common denominator of celiac disease if you have multiple autoimmune diseases. And then you follow our diet, just don't eat wheat, barley, and rye. That's all. It ain't no big deal. September 2005 newsletter, if you want to read about it, find right. newsletter. Uh, Dr. Matuga, in the last um, advanced study weekend, Dr. Ornish was there, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's yeah. my long, long, long time good professional Okay, friend. yeah, I remember his lecture was amazing. Now, I don't, I really don't recall him uh, talking about um, using any kind of dairy product. Um, are you aware of that? Someone here in the chat has mentioned that they've heard that Dr. Ornish says it's perfectly fine well, to use. 
I'm, I'm only going to use my memory, and I will stay open to be uh, criticized because Dean Dean's relationship of mine is going on for 35 years. <clears throat> In fact, we used to sell books together uh, on same <laughs> tour, same shows, uh, same bookstore signings. We'd be like a week apart on his first book and mine, which was probably in 1984. Uh, and I see him all the time uh, and talk to him all the time. So I would say mm -hmm. he's one of my closer professional friends. Now, the question is, what does he recommend? Well, very close to what I recommend, and that's what you should focus on. The differences that people want, might want to pick on between myself and our nation, say Campbell or Gregor or Esselstyn or so on. I mean, these things are important to me and maybe a little important to you, but you're, you're missing the big picture if that's what you focus on. So right. as I right. recall, as I recall, <clears throat> Dr. Arnish just recommends fish and fish oil. Uh, I believe this is not correct thinking. One, we're almost out of fish, 90% are gone. And the other is fish oil has not been shown to either primarily or secondarily prevent heart disease or strokes. Uh, it is oil, the fat you eat, the fat you wear. It causes bleeding problems. Eskimos are known for fatal nosebleeds. Uh, just don't do it. Now, as far as use of full fat dairy, I can't remember D Dean doing that, but no, he, it's, it's, it's saying that uh, he uses non-fat dairy, yogurt and cheese and egg whites. Well, you know what? I, I think that's gone on in different phases at different times. Uh, Dean Arnish uh, is un unfortunately, fortunately, or, uh, you know, I'm just too stubborn. I don't change at all, period. I've been teaching the same thing for 40 years. But Dean has gone through some uh, changes in thinking over the last 35 years that have been minor. So what he recommends at the present time, I don't know. He has a very serious involvement with a company, I believe it's called Healthways. And uh, what influence uh, they have been, I don't know. What changes Dean has made, he's, uh, you know, Dean's a, a very important guy, very good thinker. Uh, he has reasons for doing what he does, but I have reasons for doing other. I would not add low-fat dairy. I just told you the dairy protein causes type 1 diabetes and all kinds of autoimmune diseases. And, you know, my newsletter from last month is with a 2% fat chocolate milk. You can read about constipation mm -hmm. and uh, destroying the kidneys from the New England Journal of Medicine. And why would I feed people da uh, dairy protein? It makes no sense at all. It's, it's, it's not the food for people. You can't, I bet you couldn't even raise a calf on low-fat dairy. I bet right. if you tried to raise a baby cow on low-fat dairy, that cow would die. And then you go to jail. Because the animal rights people would come after you and put you in jail. But anyway, don't feed people kids. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, do you think it makes any, um, uh, would it help someone that is using insulin to avoid caffeine or is that not, is that a minor? No, I don't think it makes, I don't think avoiding caffeine if you're using insulin makes any difference. You know, coffee and alcohol and heroin and cocaine are completely different issues. Uh, we're talking about food poisoning and the proper medical care by a medical doctor. Remember, I'm a board certified internist. If you are a drunk, you know what you got to do. If you're a caffeine addict and you're enjoying it, well, maybe you'll keep doing it. You know, when people run at our, run to our, come to our program in Santa Rosa, <clears throat> that's the first lecture we tell them. We say, we are not a drug rehab program. You know, it's food. We're trying to fix you the food and your medical care. So right. don't plan on coming here and stopping your half a bottle of booze a day or your uh, two, three cups of coffee a day, because we're not going to ask you to do that. We will, however, ask you to not get the mocha, chocolate, milk, 600 calorie dairy coffee things. We'll tell you to drink it black with a little soy milk. So um, anyway, they're completely different issues. But if you're ordering from Starbucks, the one that has 600 calories of some dairy food in it, mm. then we're back to the food. That's right. Okay. That's right. Can you can you just talk for a few minutes about diabetes insipidus? You know, I could, but I won't because I can't because I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's been a long time. It has something to do with the damage of uh, the control of the pituitary, I believe. Okay. You know, okay. You, you just you're just stretching me too much, and and I'm afraid that if unless I because I didn't know a lot about it when I was a student. I've never seen a case of it, except oh. for when I was a oh. student. Maybe when I was a student, I saw a case of it. In the hospital, it's uh, just so extremely rare, and uh, my rare. memory is only so good. <laughs> right, <laughs> it's a completely different disease. It has nothing to do with what you're talking. We're talking about, except for you, your sugar is up, I believe, and you urinate a lot. Right, right. Uh, but you right. can look it up on the internet. Just you know, Wikipedia will give you a better answer than I could give you any time. Oh, right, right. 
Dr. McDougall, um, there's someone here who's asking, when I introduce the plant-based diet to type 2 diabetics, they immediately throw up a brick wall due to the idea of eating more carbs than their doctors allowed. What would be the best first approach to addressing their fears? They ought to understand, in fact, you should look them in the eyes. Mm -hmm. and you should say teachings on what to eat by the Diabetic Association or by your dietitian or by your doctor are guaranteed, are a guarantee that you will always remain diabetic. You are guaranteed by what they teach you from the American Diabetic Association, from your dietitian and your doctor, you are guaranteed to remain a type two diabetic. So you might just hit them in the face with that one. And then right. next time they ask and they say, you know, I'm tired of taking shots and pills that make me sick and all this stuff. And I'd like to be healthy. And boy, you look so healthy. You're so thin and trim and active and you're 70 years old and you're out playing with the grandkids and you're having a good, how did you do that? How did you do that? <laughs> and you say, well, <laughs> and you might start with this article, uh, September 2009, Dr. McDougall wrote, that's a good place to start. You, you just have to open people's eyes. There are people, everybody says, and I said this too 45 years ago, I'm not going to eat that way. That's crazy. Uh, I remember my, my great-grandfather, old pop, he was dying of kidney disease uh, in his late 80s because he lived on meatballs and uh, eggs. Mm -hmm. And he had terrible, terrible uh, atherosclerosis in the legs so bad he couldn't walk 15 feet. It was called caudication. He had a pot belly and he smoked a pipe. And my dad wanted to save his dad's life. And so when he developed kidney failure, my dad asked me, well, will this help my dad? I said, yeah, it'll help him a lot. And of course, I was a young man then. I gave him the best information I could. And my dad went to his dad, and my old pop looked at his son and said, I am not going to eat like some GD rabbit. That was it. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> That's it. You can do whatever you want. you know. But you ought to have a choice. And uh, old pop died at 87 of kidney failure. Wow. Uh, but yes, at that stage, we could have maybe given them a couple more years. Uh, if you want to change, fine. You, you can stay drunk. You can you, you know, just don't drive on my drive, on my street. You know, you can be drunk. You, mm -hmm. see, you can sit in your, in your bathroom, stay drunk all day long. I don't care, but don't go out on my street. Uh, right. You can uh, smoke cigarettes. But, you know, when I get down when from a tobacco smoker, because I used to be one, I get so nauseated and upset uh, that I get angry. And I know what you're talking about. But yeah, just don't yeah. smoke well, in think... my air. And you know what? You could eat the diet, whatever diet you want, except for one thing, and that is, is destroying our planet. So you can't do that. Let me say, sit here and say it's okay. It's not that okay. It's okay. It's not. It's not okay. No, you want to kill yourself, a... fine. But not on my grandchildren's dime. <laughs> That's what I say. Yes. Well, very good. Very clear. Dr. McDougall, um, I, someone was asking, of course, I've seen it in when I go to the event, if it's okay to drink plant milk, and that's ob obviously not, that's not what you were talking about earlier about well, I don't dairy. Think drink, I don't think you should be drinking glassfuls of almond milk or soy mm -hmm. milk, but it's a nice whitener for your cereal if you want, or if you drink a beverage that uh, you enjoy better with some kind of creamy or white flavor. Yeah, we use it for that. Yeah. But right. we don't encourage people, and then it's, after all, it's... Uh, you know, it's, well, it's a lot of fat usually, and sometimes they add sugar, and sometimes they add oil. you got to look at the ingredients, and it's not a beverage. Your beverage is water. You see this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> not vodka. It's water. <laughs> water. <laughs> that's your beverage, and, and that's what, you, if you want to be in good health, that's fine. Well, you say, oh, occasionally I like to have a Coke. Well, that's fine, too. You know, Coke's kind of fun. And occasionally I like to have a cup of coffee uh, or maybe every day. Oh, that's fine. And occasionally I like to have a drink. That's fine. But you know, they call people who drink every day. Yeah. You know, so uh, people who eat the American diet every day, we call them diabetics, mm -hmm. uh, heart patients, breast cancer victims, colon cancer victims. Uh, there are lots of names for people who eat the American diet every day. All right. Well, I mean, I know I just want to reiterate this to everybody here that a lot of the questions that people are writing or that they have sent, they truly are answered in the chapter in your book and in the newsletter. So I want to encourage everybody to really read those. I don't they they've, they've been sent to you. And if not, they're already posted on Dr. McDougall's website. Uh, and um, Dr. McDougall, would you just briefly comment on 
Uh, you've talked a few times about the Kempner rice diet and oh, sure. sugar in relation to diabetes. And someone is asking, um, they said that Dr. Es they've heard Dr. Esseltin talk about sugar damaging the endothelium uh, layer. Okay. Could you comment on that? Yes, I, I will comment on that. Uh, first, I want to say, uh, I bet if you watch this webinar again, you'd learn something new because <laughs> there's a lot of information I gave you. <laughs> and the other thing is on my website is a, uh, a one hour long video I did at one of the advanced study weekends, which is about diabetes, a hundred years of lost opportunity. It's oh, free. Yes. And you just go to the website, education videos, expert videos. So you want to watch an hour long video about uh, and showing all the research, the research papers, uh, that I've given on two occasions, it's there for you to watch. So you can do that, you can read the book that we talked about, you read the newsletters, there's probably another 15 newsletters I've written about type 1 diabetes, all kinds of things that are there for you to read. So it's all there for you to read. Now, you ask about sugar causing heart disease, and S and I, Dr. S and I have talked about this a lot, and he sent me mm -hmm. some research papers that suggest it does. I do not believe it to be true. Or if it is true, it's a minor issue. That's my opinion. Uh, but certainly it's not good to eat sugar. Sugar is not health food. We use a teaspoon on our oatmeal in the, uh, at breakfast, or we give you an occasional brownie. Uh, we don't feed people half bowls of sugar, like some people say. However, that leads me to Walter Kempner, one of my heroes. It's in my December 2013 newsletter. If you want to learn about Walter Kempner, uh, the doctor whose shoulders I stand on is Walter Kempner, MD, whose uh, program was at Duke for seven decades. His program supported Duke largely, financially, for two decades, <clears throat> Durham, North Carolina. I never went, met Dr. Kempner. Dr. Kempner knew who I was. I know this, because I can tell you the story of why, because I wrote about him in my books, and he was so proud that somebody wrote good things about him. It's in the medicine book that you have. Might even be in the diabetes chapter I sent you, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> But uh, Walter Kempner was a, a German who was brought to uh, Duke in 1934 uh, by the president of Duke University. And in 1939, Kempner started the Rice Program. Extremely valuable program. When I learned about this, it taught me two things. One is the idea of protein, calcium, or nutritional deficiency was utter nonsense. And by the way, his patients had been carefully tested in a live-in situation because they wanted to prove that his diet would hurt people and it was shown not to. But you'll find that when you read the December 13, excuse me, December 2013 newsletter. So he started practice in 1939 at Duke. And by 1953, I was seven years old. He had shown that you could reverse coronary artery disease based on EKGs before I was born. He showed that sugar actually makes type two diabetics better. His diet was 93% sugar, sugar. It was made of white rice. Why? Because he felt it was palatable and easily available. Brown works. He would white, wash the white rice to get the salt off. Uh, fruit, fruit juice and table sugar. And uh, not often, but sometimes half the diet had to be table sugar because his patients were so sick with kidney failure and heart failure that that's all they could tolerate. They couldn't tolerate the extra protein in the rice. So he had to dilute the rice with table sugar to get the protein load down. So these patients with severe kidney disease could stay alive. But this was a miracle diet. This is a therapeutic diet. This is a diet for the deadly. And of course, people have taken my words and twisted them to make a trap for fools by saying that's what I recommend, and that's not mm -hmm. true. But I, on occasion, I have to use the Kempner diet. I take care of sick people. I am a doctor. I am a medical doctor. I use what tools work, and Kempner is phenomenal. So anyway, he showed you could reverse the rheumatoid arthritis, coronary artery disease, uh, severe morbid hypertension, uh, all kinds of problems Walter Kempner did. Every doctor should be taught about Walter Kempner. It should be required medical school teaching is the most effective treatment there is. December 2013 newsletter, if you want to learn about Nathan Pritikin, I've told you that's February 2013. And Dennis Burkett, my other hero, is January 2013. I have videos on both Kempner and Pritikin that I did, the only videos that exist. 
And on the December 2013, you'll see two videos done by Kempner's mentors because he never allowed his picture to be taken. But two of his mentor, mentors, Robert Rosati and Francis Nealon, who are friends of mine, they're 74 years old now. I did interviews with them that you can watch that talk about their uh, their doctor, Dr. Kempner, who they worked with for decades. Uh, yeah, you should know about Kempner. Yes, Kempner is important. Uh, the diet McDougall teaches is the diet for the living. The Kempner diet is the diet for the nearly dead. Costs no. nothing, not mm -hmm. popular. Right. Makes yeah, no money, exactly. by the way. By the way, it makes no money for Duke, so it's gone. So it's gone. So it's gone. And I would say that's the reason it's gone. So you can tell the people at Duke, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't make money, so it's gone. Yeah, really. Well, they got, uh, they got uh, they have big cardiovascular. Uh, 80, by the way, I'm not just speaking about Duke, but 80% of a hospital's income in general mm -hmm. comes from heart disease. Right. Why would right. you? Why would you? Why would you throw? Why would you throw out the uh, the golden goose? Why would you throw out the? Why would you throw out the golden goose and feed somebody a healthy diet? It makes no sense at all. I got a hospital just five miles from here. It's the newest, fanciest, biggest building in Santa Rosa, California. Mm -hmm. It's oh, yeah. gorgeous, and there's money flowing in there all day long with unnecessary diseases. If they people changed in Santa Rosa, the diet I recommend. That place would be out of business by next year. It would crumble. Mm -hmm. They would use it as a, a, a it'd be an old warehouse. You'd be dying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, there the hospitals are. I mean, my area too. They're expanding. They're beautiful. They're oh, man. Uh, it's, it's just business, ladies and gentlemen. Don't take business. it personal. Uh, nice nurses well, work there. Nice nurse doctors work there. Susan. Yeah, great, great webinar. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madrugal. We, we need to close for today. Oh, yeah. We haven't answered all the questions, but we will probably do another one on, on diabetes in the near future. And oh, yeah. uh, I want to encourage everybody to, if you want to send questions, send them to webinar at drmcdougall.com and those questions are collected and then we'll try to include them in the webinar. Thank you, Gustavo, and thank you yes. for your help. And I just want to, just just for a recap, uh, you need to read the news though that just came out in October. Right. It, it, right. it is a total slap in the dairy industry's face. They ought to have attorneys on my door for what I said, unless it was true. Then yes. they have a problem. And that is they'd be, giving me, a, they'd be giving me a stage and everybody else would <laughs> find out what I said is true. So I'm not going to do that. And uh, you should tell your friends. I mean, tell all your friends about the webinar and about the... You know the things that we do on our free website and, mm -hmm. and the new book. Well, I got to say something about the new book, the healthiest diet on the planet, because it's a color picture book and you don't have to read. Okay, so right. You, you, take, you go to a friend, <laughs> you say, "Look at all these pictures." You don't have to read, and you learn everything that Google has to say. And then uh, I guess December's our next ten-day program. We've been running some big corporate programs lately. If you know any corporations that want to cut their uh, uh, cut their expenses down and greatly increase their profits, just give Gustavo or I an email because we can save GM, IBM, uh, American Airlines. We can save them yes. millions of dollars and give them better really? employees. So that's December 2nd. We run the next public program, but we run other corporate programs. And then I think Mary would like to have, see you in Kauai, January, mm -hmm. end of January 2017. So right, that's kind right. of a recap. Fun for me. Yeah, I want to encourage everybody, to please, if you can, go to the 10-day program in December. It will truly change your life. And I'm looking forward to seeing you, Dr. McDougall and Mary and everybody else in the Hawaii trip. Yeah, you're going to be there. Uh, Do it uh, now. I would encourage you if you have interest to, to move now, mm -hmm. uh, not wait later and say, I wish I would have. Yeah, I know. It's a great way to start the new year with all the knowledge and everything ready yeah. to go. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you, Dr. Awesome. I, I will save you more money on pills and surgery than you could spend on oh. uh, 10 oh, yeah. Kauai trips and six trips to the program and three advanced study programs. Uh, you know, we, we were just saying, look, I'm going to end with this. Just We ran a big corporate program. I don't have to name it. This. It doesn't make any difference. But there are almost 120 people there. And the amount of money spent on those 120 people is less than one bad heart surgery for any company that went bad. It costs less money than one 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 of their employees that had heart surgery that didn't mm -hmm. go well is all the money they spent to get 90% of the people off their drugs, 120 people. Uh, to right. get, we, we caused a 
3,000 point drop in cholesterol, a 220 pound weight loss in five days. I'm through, Gustavo. I'm done. I'm out of here. <laughs> All right. Had a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, have fun. Join us. Uh, Goodbye. Uh, we'll see you next class. week with Dr. Lyle. So please send us yeah, questions okay. for him. Thank you. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Mugler. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.